Yeah. No, we only have one chance to make the first impression. The quality of the questions we ask will determine how people yeah. judge us. To earn the right to do good discovery, you've got to turn up with a point of view mm-hmm. so that in the mind of the client, there's a reason why they're giving you information. There's a topic that seems to be at the forefront of people's minds at the moment, which is, which is around... You know, it's hard to it's hard to create pipelines. It's hard to find really good opportunities. So when we find them, how do we maximize our chance of success? Yep. And at the very beginning of that process, once we have the opportunity, there's this conversation around qualification, discovery, needs analysis. There's a million different terms for it, but it's the finding out bit at the start, really. Yeah. Um, just let's put all kind of formal methodologies to one side. I'm just interested if you have some tips and tricks you could you could share with anyone watching today to just help them get better at that at that you know, critical part of the, um, of the sales process. I'll go first if you yeah, like. I, yeah. I, I think yeah, one of the things I encourage people to think of, of is, is think about helping the customer qualify rather than you qualifying. Now, so mm. you think about the questions you ask, think about the discussion you need to have with the customer. And it's, it's vital that for the customer, you don't want to waste their time, they don't want to waste your time. Yep. We both need to get on with business. So ask the questions and, and, and you know, don't ask the questions, the typical questions, have you got budget and all that sort of yeah. stuff. Because you know, they, want, they don't know that. And then at the beginning of the, the sales process, they not, not, might not. I mean, Ken, I've heard you raise the, the subject a lot. Ask the customer what their buying process is so that we can mm. support you well. Yeah. And out of that, you get information. Yeah. We haven't even thought about a buying process at the moment, yeah. right? Well, okay, that, that's an issue. So if you went through a buy, so you need to have that sort of dialogue, but let the customer do the qualification as much as we do mm-hmm. and recognise this will be either a win-win or a lose-lose. And we, you know, nobody's going to have a win-loss. So yeah. you know, we need to go through the process properly, helping each other through the process. And if one stops helping the other, yeah. we need to find out why. Okay. I like that. Um, You know, the thing for me is that the only constraining resource for anyone in sales is really time. Mm -hmm. Um, It's very rare for there to be not enough market for somebody. So the the reality is, where do they apply their time? So a couple of things are really important. Rather than failing to do your own research very well and then stumping up somewhere and trying to qualify the person, we should always be thinking about ideal customer profile. So Mm -hmm. every seller should think, what is an ideal customer profile? Who are the the roles, the buyer personas I engage with? And then I need a hypothesis of value that I take to them. So they're kind of basically qualified anyway because I'm I'm targeting well. And then to me, I'm I'm with you rather than these basic qualification frameworks, and there's lots of them. To me, the thing that tells us whether we should keep investing our time with a potential client is the degree to which they'll give us access to their people and the amount of quality information they'll share with us. Mm. So if it's not a two-way dance, if they're not sharing good information with us, which is part of discovery and qualification will flow out of it, yeah. but they do that on the basis that we're trying to understand and help them with their business case and how they can achieve consensus in the organization for the change piece. Yeah. And then if they don't sponsor us to others so we can go validate, then I would tend to qualify out you know, rather than these other basic frameworks. Yeah. It's the degree of engagement that really does it for me. So I just want to pick up on something you said there because I think it's quite interesting. We we talk about how much information they'll share, right? But we have to earn the right, in my Do. opinion, f- to have them share that information with Great. us in the first place. So, you know, we've, we've all heard this kind of like, oh, you know, Mr. Customer, what keeps you awake at night? And I heard a lovely kind of response to that from, I think it was a CFO who, who said, don't ask me what keeps me awake at night. Tell me what should be keeping me awake at night. Yeah. Because that, that's about bringing insight and perspective. But I think there's, there's, there's another component to this, which is we have a sales process, right? Or we, ostensibly, we have a sales process. How structured is our discovery? So if I come sit down with you and have a, a blank sheet of paper and ask you some questions, there's, there's very little structure to that. If I have a, a little bit more structure and the questions are written down, maybe you're going to share a little bit more. But if I say to you, before our first meeting, there's a whole lot of information that you could share that'd be really helpful, which would w- ensure we get more, we give you more value in that first meeting. Can I send you a quick link to, you know, to share some stuff? So I give you some context as to why I have a, a process that exists that, that you know, Makes, makes me feel as a customer, okay, great, you've got a process, you've given me the reason why you want to ask me these questions, it's going to ensure that we get more value in the next meeting. All of a sudden, at the very first step, but so many organizations, if you say to them, show me, tell me about your sales process, and they start talking, show it to me. They really struggle to. Show me your discovery yeah. process. So therefore, any interaction I have with salespeople is going to differ 
depending on who the salesperson is and what process they've decided to put in place. Some are more relaxed, some are more ad hoc, some are more formal. That's crazy because if they, yeah. you know, we only have one chance to make the first impression. The quality of the questions we ask will determine how people yeah. judge us. And yet we're, we're allowing all of that to just sort of float and not be, be locked in. I think that's a missed opportunity. Discovery itself is a process. And if we don't think about discovery being a process, we're doing our customer a major disservice as mm. well as ourselves. Yep. And, and we learn through process, it's, uh, through the discovery as we go through the process. Now, in, in a B2B sale, often a, a discovery can be multiple meetings. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, and I like your idea of getting them to give some advanced information, but you can just as easily go in the first meeting's a half hour meeting, we're setting the scene, we're going to have a number of meetings, if, if we'd all pre progress this, yeah. this is what I want to learn out of the first meeting, and then could I have you prepare some information for us so that we, we can be very well prepared for the second meeting and yeah. so on. Uh, but for me, it's a process, and, and, and salespeople need to understand and have a very clear process for just discovery. And, and I, I use the old adage of going down the hill and up, uh, down the hole and up the hill, uh, that I know Bill Carson talks about a lot about, uh, and that is the first part of the process is getting right down and dirty with the customer, understanding their situation and, and bringing insight to the, the uh, through the questions you ask about their current situation, yeah. where they so that makes makes them say, oh, okay. You've brought something of value in the thought process there, but you're still learning about the current yeah. situation. It's only when you've finished doing that, you now say, okay, let me ask a few what if questions. What if you did it this way? What yeah. if you did it that way? You now take them up the hill yeah. with a thought process that takes them to a whole new way of thinking that now yeah. you can help them deliver to. So can I ask, pick up on that and ask you a question, Tony? And this might be a bit, I don't know, uh, out there, but... Let's say, for argument's sake, that you're working with an organization, they do really good discovery, like really good yep. discovery. They find out a ton of stuff, but that sits in someone's notebook, and it doesn't form a part of the corporate memory of that organization. How, how flawed is that as, a, as, mm. as an approach to selling? It's hugely flawed, right? Because you've got no chance of prescribing solutions if it's not based on accurate information, right? Mm. So... Um, I'm okay with people taking old school notes yeah, in a yeah, meeting, yeah, right? But, but, but they need to get it into a system. Um, so it's incredibly important that what they play back to the customer show, shows understanding and actually shows relevance. Yeah. And the thing I think we, we all agree about is to earn the right to go deep, to earn the right to do good discovery, you've got to turn up with a point of view mm -hmm. so that in the mind of the client, there's a reason why they're giving you information. Yeah. So we all agree with that. Yeah, agree. Um, you know, but the thing to me is every sales manager should be asking their sales reps and every rep should be asking themselves this same question. And that is, why will the customer change the way that they're currently operating? And then at a secondary level, why do we think that they'll want to do that with us? With us yeah. right? Because if you don't have clarity about that as a seller or as a sales leader, the yeah. chances of winning this opportunity or at not resulting in the customer going, that was all interesting, but we won't do anything at the moment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, which is a big threat, is, is a really high risk. Well, so, and and one, of the, one of the best, simplest, but most profoundly valuable questions I ever had that, that I asked during my sales career was, what happens if you do nothing? Just yeah. to help me understand, we're here today talking about this issue, this problem is, you know, but you've, you've got a million competing other issues and problems and things yeah. that are looking for yeah. budgeting. What happens if you do nothing? nothing. Like, do, do we fall off a cliff in a month or in six months or a year? Or is it just business as usual? That's right. Because that's a very, very interesting question to open up and almost force them to sell back to you on the reason they're going to do something. And if they don't have I a agree. strong, compelling argument as to what happens if we do nothing, then either you, you've got a lot of work ahead of you to build a business case around this, That's right. or you might want to qualify out or pass it back to marketing or someone else in the business, because the, there may not be any business to be you, done. You use the word compelling there. You really have to understand why this is so compelling to the customer. Yeah. But I, I use the, you know, obviously push very heavily. You need a compelling event. Mm. So you also need to get, the, and, and I've seen you do this very well, where you get the customer to talk about the, buy, the buying journey yep. they're going to go yeah. through. What's the event that's going to push them over the hill? Yep. That actually, yeah. you can have a compelling reason, but as you say, there's lots of things competing against that compelling yeah, reason. Yeah, yeah. So if you get that together with an event, very specifically, you put them over the Well, and here's the bill. thing. In the in the absence of a compelling event, because there isn't always a compelling event. Agreed. In the absence of a compelling event, they need a compelling business case. Yes, they do. Because if there's not, the danger is it just won't make it up the priority list. And you'll have a zombie deal that never dies. It sits <laughs> in CRM forever and ever. Yeah. So I just want to come back to something, right? And I'll, I'll share a quick story. Um, so I run my own business. 
um, we use a variety of different technology. I, I received an email um, a little while ago from a, um, an account manager telling me that they were my new account manager for a particular piece of technology we use in the business. And by the way, they happen to have a really good offer on, um, on, on you know, their tech this month and isn't that great. And by the way, they'd like to get to know my business a little bit more. Not a great email, not a, not a terrible email, not a great email, mm-hmm. except for the fact that I'd probably had 10 interactions with this individual before they then sent me an email introducing themselves to me for the first time. Wow. So I want to. I just want to explore this this point. So if I met you for the first time and you told me, or John, and you told me a little bit about your lives, your family, and your this, and your dog, and and then I met you again and I said, so Tony, are you married? Are you? Where do you live? And you, you know, it would seem odd. It would seem rude. Yeah. But we're doing this on to a customers. regular basis to customers. We're, you know, we're trying to create a foundation or a platform, and then we're allowing it to wash away because it's not getting captured, it's not getting understood, and it's not getting built on. It's just. It's just this constant sort of cycle where, where customers are then having to teach our account managers about their business because we should know that, but we, we haven't taken the time to capture it. Or we're, we're not doing as good a job as we could in the sales cycle because they've given us the information, but we haven't captured it and then understood it and used it. If a customer gives you any information at all, even if you think there's, there's no value to that information, it has to be captured. I've been caught many times before where the customer told me something well, that wasn't very important or valuable and I never made a note of it. Yeah. And then a decision was made and I realised how important it was. If the yeah. customer tells you, it's important to them. Yeah, and we need to use our CRMs properly, right? So Because you've got, you've got no chance of creating great customer experience, marketing, selling, service, support, yeah. all of those things if you don't have a great system of record that yeah. supports life cycle. But creating that platform is of no use if people aren't using it to enable their process. Right? It, it's, it, you know, you made a comment earlier on, which is, you know, salespeople tend not to be very detail focused, and that's and and that's true to to some degree. But I'll caveat that when it comes to customer in, information, yeah. we need to be rigorous. We need to have serious yeah. hygiene around that because that is that is the you know the critical component to us being successful in our careers. And not yes. only that, it's just polite. Because if you tell me stuff and I, I and I don't care enough to actually take note of it, then you know why should you give me more of your time? Yeah. Well, it defines professionalism. It too. absolutely does, and it also enables you to hold the customer to account. If you've got all yeah. this information, then they Correct. try and tell you something different. Well, hang on yeah. a second. On the fifth of June, you told me this. I need to yeah. understand why it's this now. Yeah. Right. Really, really important. And then the customer will respect you a lot. They will more. respect you. Yeah. Awesome.